I will give you a, a top-down perspective on land use. Hooking up to many things that have been said already by Patrick, but also by Pete, on land use and its interrelation to earth system components, which are at the heart of sustainability challenges. Um, we have heard about that, so I will be very brief here. Land use is, um, and here I am preaching to the wise, uh, land use is at the core, at the heart of many sustainability challenges. It is part of the planetary boundaries. Some scholars even made land use itself a planetary boundary. Um, but land use also interacts with many other planetary boundaries, which are to the biophysical outside, if you look at, this, uh, at the sustainability donut, but also to the social and socio-economic cultural inside of our planetary boundaries. And at the same time, land use is interlinked closely and intimately to the sustainability challenges. Some of them are mentioned here, and please uh, excuse if this is just an arbitrary selection of those where I think we really, doing land system science, have direct links. Um, I will, in this talk, given that it's only 20 minutes, not focus on each and every sustainability development goals. This is not possible, but I will pick out one, one particular one, which is very close to my heart, which has to do with the climate nexus, with the land and climate nexus. We all know that there are a social dynamics going on, which are important, and which need, actually, the support of us scientists. The young people started to protest that it's their future which is at stake, and that politicians are not moving, and we scientists cannot do better by informing them. And therefore, also because I would like to do this personal choice of focusing particular on the climate land nexus, but this is, of course, not exclusive. This is just to give one strand in these 20 minutes ahead of you and us. Okay. Today, land use confronts us with a challenge of unprecedented scale. Um, we know that three-quarters of the land surface of the terrestrial ice-free land surface is occupied by humans, is appropriated by humans. Um, only one quarter is left untouched something like untouched directly. Of course, there are indirect consequences, which we see there as well. Um, and most of this, two quarters, uh, two thirds of this untouched land is actually either too cold or too hot. So we will not really would like to go there. And only few things, few ecosystems are really left untouched. If you look at the past half century, we see dynamics as well of unprecedented change. Um, down there you see the global sum, and then you see some regional uh, sums of the, of the different trajectories. The first plate, the first insert, shows you the area changes. And we see there are some area changes, but the area changes, they are very important. They are key, and they have been key to our focus. But in the end, they are much, much more subtle than other changes we observe. But in certain regions, we see some strong changes. For instance, if you look at southern Asia, the expansion of cropland. Or if you look at Europe, actually something like a, ret a returning, a, an abandonment of land. You see a decrease of cropland and a return of forests here. Um, if we move to the second plate, we see dynamics of a much higher, uh, of a much, much higher factor, which relates to the production. Production of goods in forestry, animal production and crop production, which is really surging uh, in the last decades. And this is unique across all, more or less across all regions we see here, and which have been grouped here. And sitting on top, we are not just growing in dynamics of producing ever more on, let's say, more or less stable areas, so we are intensifying the planet. We also are deeply increasing the interconnectedness between regions. And you see here in the third plate the changes in the regions of the international trade. Now here expressed in percentage of domestic production, so this dynamics sits on top of the production dynamics. And all these dynamics we face here are connected with sustainability challenges, biodiversity ch crisis, uh, degradation, um, desertification, of course, going on. The issue of food security, we have heard this of Pete, hunger is coming back. Um, the problem of governance with this level of interconnectedness, it's not so easy to tackle these challenges, and now land use gets another one. Land use gets the challenge of climate change as well. Well, land use is an emitter of, of uh, carbon and of GHGs, of greenhouse gas emissions, but it is kind of smaller than the industrial processes. 
And the problem is if we fail to reduce the emissions from the industrial processes and from land use, we will really strongly affect the land systems. Either by increasing, for instance, the vulnerability of the terrestrial ecosystems to produce goods and services we need. For instance, here, a study which showed us that the cereal production is strongly determined and strongly coined in the temporal signal by the uh, emergence of extreme events, mainly temperature-related, drought, for instance, extreme events. And what will the, the future bring? If we fail to keep climate change somehow to reduce emissions and to keep climate change, to mitigate climate change by reducing emission, another game will start. The 1.5 report tells us, the 1.5 report by the IPCC tells us that we have to act urgent, urgently, quickly, in order to avoid overshoot. Even if we have good measures, if we would have good measures at hand, in order to avoid over overshoot, we need two things. We have to act early, quickly, and we need something like negative emission technologies. And who is providing these negative emission technologies? This will be land. And the last uh, figure here down on the right side shows you that forecasts or scenarios of the probable demand for bioenergy providing this. Bioenergy, for instance, for bags, so for bioenergy, fuel, carbon capture and storage technologies, but also maybe for afforestation, so let forests grow, will need land. It will provide a lot of sources. Here, this one shows you bioenergy demand. And depending on the uh, degree of target we are looking at, so if we are ambitious or not, and on the timeliness of our action, we will have to, and, and our, the ability to change the economic system, we will have maybe other 20 gigatons of biomass used solely of bioenergy. Well, now 20 gigatons, this is a big figure. It does not tell us much, but the next slide will tell us what is the proportion, what is the importance of this figure. Uh, now I switch to a key component in the nexus of the land and the climate system, which is biomass. And biomass is a central link between the atmosphere and the biosphere. It provides large pools. It is a storage of carbon. It is associated with the single largest flows, cross-primary production and respiration are the largest flows in the global carbon system. Um, but these in and out fluxes are largely balanced. But if fluxes are large and if fluxes are nearly balanced, we know perturbation of these fluxes can create a mess very easily. Then, Biomass is the basis of whole heterotrophic life. Biomass accumulates in the system, net primary production accumulates in the system, it builds up pools of biomass, and all heterotrophic life is feeding on this, including us humans. Without biomass, we cannot really do a lot. And now coming back to the 20 gigatons of dry biomass, we see here 20 gigatons, and these are fresh weight figures in biomass, if you look at the green line here, um, this would mean almost more than doubling, let's say a doubling, of the global biomass harvest on Earth. Now we have already a world full of degradation with a today level of, the, of, of, of harvest. And if we double this, it's not easy to say what the consequences for the sustainability challenges will be, but we can somehow imagine it will not be so easy. Um, well, biomass as a resource is key. In the past 100 years ago, biomass accounted for nearly uh, uh, three quarters of the, of the total resource consumption of the global society. This dropped down to one quarter today. So today we only use one quarter in biomass in our metabolism, but not because we substituted fossil fuels for biomass, but because the fossil fuel system was growing so tremendously. Um, global resource use was increasing by a factor 12, and biomass, in contrast, was only increasing by a factor 4. But its relative importance was falling back. What tells us this? Biomass is not substitutable. We cannot substitute biomass with other things. And it is an extremely vulnerable resource for our life. Um, well, now, if we want to study the dynamics of biomass or the influence of biomass on land use on biomass, we have to develop approaches which allow us to isolate the land use impacts from natural impacts. Because biomass in the ecosystem will always react to the natural dynamics, temperature, precipitation, nitrogen availability and so forth, and to land use at the same time. 
And therefore, we need approaches which allow us to isolate the land use impact. And the approach where I will show three empirical examples in the next slides, we developed uh, at our institute is to compare the potential state with the actual state of vegetation. Yeah? What is the potential state of vegetation? What is the potential vegetation? It is a concept which was developed in ecology and it denotes a hypothetical vegetation state that would prevail without land use, hypothetically. We cannot imagine a world without land use, as I have shown you. But hypothetically, let's eliminate land use and kind of allow for spontaneous re-establishment of the natural undisturbed vegetation but, and this is important, with current climate. So we have the situation, potential vegetation without land use and current climate. The actual vegetation is, of course, with land use and current climate. And if we compare the two, we factor out the environmental changes and isolate the land use impacts. And it is important at this point to note that the potential vegetation is not the prehistoric vegetation. For instance, the biome shifts which we have observed over, or which we have modeled over the last millennia, or the changes in coastlines are not factored in. It is the current potentials we are facing too. And now these changes, which can be brought by land use, and uh, Patrick has showed us here a slide, which is much more sophisticated, we can discern two types of changes. One is the land cover conversions. So when we change one ecosystem for another, a forest for a cropland, or a natural grassland uh, for a pasture, for instance, and land cover modifications, where we do not change the type of the land cover, but we have more subtle changes, which we could call land cover modifications, or to keep it shorter, we call management. And now we could isolate these two, and something, an approach which was relatively, uh, uh, let's say, famous in doing that is the human appropriation of net primary production. Here the result for the year 2000 in the grid. Uh, we are currently working on an update on that for the year 2012. Uh, what do we see in the upper part? We see the change of productivity, which is about 10% on the global average, but with huge regional variation. We have regions where we have big losses of productivity, but we have also regions where the productivity is much higher than the potential productivity. And down there, we add other 15% points to the human appropriation of NPP because we don't change productivity for the sake of changing productivity. We do it to get harvest out of the system. And so we end up with uh, approximately one quarter of NPP in the year 2000. Well, what have been the dynamics over the last decade? Uh, we see HANPP was growing by a factor two, which is actually good news, because population at the same time was growing by a factor four. So we have decoupled land use pressures from population, which is a good thing. And we even did much better in doing it with economic terms. GDP grew by a factor 17 over the last 100 years. And HANPP, the pressure on land, only by a factor two. And we see food supply per capita, so adding on the population dynamics, increased by a factor of 1.3, which eventually is a good news. But how could we do that? Well, by intensification. By means that allow us to boost productivity of ecosystems. And as you will see later, many of these technologies we use are fossil fuel based. For instance, the increase in fertilizer per area, fertilization per area, increased by a factor eight since the year 1960, or an increase of the crop yields as a result by a factor three in this period. Well, this is the look at the flows, at the fluxes, NPP is a flux. If we talk climate, climate change, the nexus of land and climate, we have to think about stocks. It is the stock of carbon in the atmosphere, and it is the stock of, bio, uh, of carbon which is stored on land. And here, how to do the same for biomass stocks, we did the same. We developed maps for the potential and for the actual vegetation in biomass stock maps in order to isolate the land use impact. Well, we could, due to the large discrepancies between the existing authoritative estimates of biomass stocks, we could not come up with the one best guess as we could with NPP, for instance. But we decided rather to come up with the b compilation of the best maps available today and their spread. And accept that they are uncertain and accept that we cannot really decide which one of this is the best one. Um, the potential vegetation here, we had developed six maps 
and at the extra vegetation we developed seven maps and we calculated the permutation of these three and what did we find out? Land use, the isolated effect of land use is halving the potential carbon storage. So we only have, instead of 920 petagrams, we only have 450 petagrams on the average left. Yeah, this is quite a lot. This is an equivalent of the 50 years of current anthropogenic carbon emissions. So this is quite a lot, and this tells us why restoration of ecosystem is such a powerful mitigation means. But we could go a little bit further on that, and we could show that the land management part, so these subtle, more subtle changes which do not change the land conversion, and this was surprising to us, that they account for half of this reduction. They are as important as they are as the land conversions, as the deforestation signal is. This is quite surprising, and this is explained by the fact that they affect very much large areas, as you can see in this map. Okay? And this management comp uh, consists, for instance, of grazing of natural grasslands, harvest of wood in forests, wood fuel collection in other wooded lands, but also secondary uses like forest grazing. Okay? Now we have to see that this is now not this 450 petagram carbon is not a cumulative emission of carbon to the atmosphere because the potential vegetation is not a historic emission. It consists of two factors. Yeah? It, one thing is the cumulative emission, and the other one is that land use kind of does not allow vegetation to grow. And these two effects make up this human impact, this land use impact on biomass stocks. But if we look at the results, we can find, of our result, we find three ways of explaining or contextualizing our result. The first one is that industrialization, uh, the, industri the, the land use emissions during the industrialization are actually smaller than the pre-industrial emissions, which brings us close to the Rudiman hypothesis. But there is also a, some indication, and it has to do with a lot of the uncertainties here, um, that the carbon sink strength is actually underestimated. And the third result, or the third conclusion we can draw here, that I did not put here, is that maybe, and this is possible, the IPCC factors we have been using, the best practice guidance factors, are not really good. That is the third explanation, and we do not really hope for that, because a lot of politics are built on these factors. So, rather these two choices here. Okay, uncertainties are large. Uh, uncertainties are large, and I will not dig into that, but I will show you where are they largest. They are largest in the tropical areas, but not in the humid core, in the drier around, surrounding the, the, the areas surrounding the drier cores. This is where we really have tremendous uncertainties in the land system, in the biomass stock systems. And this is, for instance, where a lot of the bioenergy potential has been, has been seen in the future. So we have to be very careful about what we know about the system. To move on. What about the changes? What about uh, changes in time? And we see in some regions we have a loss, still an ongoing loss of biomass stocks. In other regions, on the left-hand side you see it, in the northern and the boreal zones, we have a return of forests. We have a return of carbon stored in biomass. Well, if we look at some panel analysis, we see that this forest increase is strongly correlated with economic development and development of, uh, with the HDI, for instance, Human Development Index. So, is economic development a solution to bring us back to a ca more carbon-rich vegetation? I would say, hmm, maybe yes, maybe no. The, thing is more, the things are, of course, more complicated. First of all, uh, trade is outsourcing. Industrialized countries are outsourcing uh, their deforestation imprint. We see here that the post Forest transition countries are getting a lot of biomass from regions which have deforestation still. And then we see on the right-hand side that we have still a growth in carbon emissions. It is not from land use. It is not, uh, it is not going backwards, even if we have economic growth going on. Um, but we see on the right-hand side on the panel here that we have large co-benefits co -benefits between protecting carbon stocks and comp or the carbon sequestration function or biodiversity. There are some very particular sectors like forestry and cattle which are important to tackle. But we also see it is not just about efficiency gains. We have to be very careful about the rebound effects. We have seen them all over the place. So we have to think about the demand reductions. We have to think about the demand side options. Now I'm trying to put the pieces together and we'll come to a conclusion slide. 
We have seen the fluxes, we have seen the stocks. We can look at the relation of fluxes and stocks, and this is the turnover rate. And if we do so, we see humans have accelerated the mean residence time of carbon and vegetation by a factor two. Instead of 13 years or 14 years in the potential vegetation, carbon only stays seven years. And what does this mean? Well, we see the impact on carbon stocks is much higher than on NPP. Well, this is kind of intuitive. Humans want to have a high productivity, but they don't care about the stocks. We don't care. Well, the stocks are unimportant. We want to have production. Okay? We see also that more than 80% of today's biomass consumed is coming from fast ecosystems. Slow ecosystems do not play a big role in the provision of this key ecosystem service, uh, which brings us to a trade-off between increasing uh, carbon stocks or increasing productivity. Maybe there are systemic reasons that we cannot do the same at both sides. And now, and Naveen is already telling me time's up, a last slide, where, which I will not read uh, point by point, but what do we see? We should not forget that the land system and the socioeconomic systems are intricately linked, intimately linked, and they belong together, in particular the socioeconomic energy system. Manage management effects are large, but uncertainties are large as well, and we have to nail down uncertainties. And in particular, we have to improve the systemic understanding between the land dynamics and the earth system dynamics in order to find uh, the synergies, to identify them. And I will be very curious about the three days of discussion and the new questions which emerge, are emerging along these lines here. And in particular, I think we need to be more careful and pay more attention on the time dimension of change. When is time happening? How fast is time hap changes happening? Be what is the relation to the overshoot? And with this, I thank you and I apologize for being over time. Thank you. Um, as we are running behind time, we are going to have just a few minutes for questions of clarification. And it uh, looks like this meeting is being run by wannabe millennials, so all <coughs> questions have to come through Slido. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so the, we have only one question so far, and it's from Earl Ellis. Um, mm -hmm. What is the planetary boundary for land, and what is the scientific evidence for it? Uh, well, from my, from my presentation, you might have smelt it that I'm not really a fan of putting a planetary boundary to an extent of land, to a certain amount of area which we take. We have occupied the entire planet. It's about the quality of land use. That would be my thing. And it's not so easy to put thresholds to a quality aspect. So I have to say, uh, Earl, I'm sorry, I cannot give you an answer on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Carl. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. 